we'll see how many happy dollars we have after this. <laughs> and, uh, I uh, thank you for the privilege to be here today, and I want you to think about a couple of things as we go forward. I was listening to Rabbi Zachariah message the other day on, on freedom, and uh, we say uh, when we're talking about our country, we say well, freedom is not freedom. We said out of respect for the men and women and their families who have served in the military, and and we are free as a country. We're America's a free country. You could also argue that China's a free country. Nobody's attacking China. You could argue that Russia's a free country. You could argue that the vast majority of the countries in the world right now are free. But what they don't have is the personal freedoms in those countries that we as Americans have enjoyed throughout our life. And that's one of the key differences in, in and our freedom and our definition of freedom as a, as a country and, and the definition that we hear uh, used in, in other parts of the world. We'll talk about the Iran deal a little bit, and that's one of the key issues, I think, is that in that part of the world, the only country really who understands freedom the same way we do um, is Israel. Uh, but I thought, since it's near and dear to my heart right now, I'll talk a little bit about the health care bill. Uh, it's near and dear to me right now because I'm having a lot of neck pain. And uh, I've got a dad who's an orthopedic surgeon. He, uh, he now, uh, the hospital has purchased his practice, as is uh, happening with the majority of our uh, medical practices that are, that are smaller, which is what we have in, the, in what I would call uh, the non-metropolitan areas of the state, even, even in met technically metropolitan areas, many of our practices are smaller. But what's happened over the last couple of years with when uh, the health care bill passed is we're seeing a consolidation not only of health care service providers but we're also seeing a tremendous consolidation among the insurance industry we as the american citizens in that piece of legislation that they passed were mandated to purchase a financial product and health insurance is a financial product and they left the industry that we have to purchase that product from exempt from the antitrust laws <coughs> of the country. <coughs> Think about what's happening with the cost of health care. Nitroglycerin tablets, if you'll talk to your local pharmacist, they've gone from eight cents a piece to eight dollars a piece in the last couple of years. Same thing has happened with doxycycline and other, other drugs that have been on, on, on the market for decades that used to cost pennies a piece. Now in the last couple of years, cost dollars a piece. My dad's an orthopedic surgeon, so I talk with him about the neck. I'm going to ride the MRI machine tomorrow. Uh, uh, the next day, I'm sorry, it was the earliest they could get me in. Um, but he said, you know, you really ought to take Celebrex. I think it will help with it. And my wife texted me at the table. Uh, Celebrex is not covered, and there is no generic. It was $250. So you're going to keep taking the pain meds. <laughs> so it, it, um, we've got a piece of legislation. We have a law on the books that isn't doing what it was designed to do. We have we have tried to rewrite it. Uh, unfortunately, I don't foresee changes uh, being made as long as uh, our current president is in office. But I want you to know, as as the Republican who wrote a key portion of uh, the Republican legislation in response to it, the first thing I did was to take away the antitrust exemption that the health insurance has, health, health insurance industry has. You cannot mandate that the citizens of this country are required to purchase a product and then leave the industry that they're required to purchase it from exempt from the antitrust laws of this country. We have got to fix some of these things, or the situations that I'm talking about today uh, are going to get worse. I know I'm not the only person in here who's got the bad news on medicine that a doc said you need to take this and, and can't go get it. We've got to fix this. The other thing that's got to happen is, is we've got to have more transparency with regard to where the costs are and where the money's going. Most of us are paying significantly more for our health insurance today than we were before. I know I am. I had a health savings account. It's what I wanted. It worked for me. I no longer have it. 
I had to wait my health savings account, had a $3,500 out of pocket maximum. My new, my new plan that I'm forced to purchase has a $7,000 out of pocket maximum, and I'm paying significantly more for it. There are things that can and should be done. Part of it is transparency. Part of it is putting competition back into that model. I want you to take time when you get home. I want you to look up the term pharmacy benefit manager. Uh, ask your local pharmacist about them. Become more acquainted with this term pharmacy benefit manager. These are the people that are the middlemen in the legal drug trade, if you will. They're the ones that determine that I don't get to uh, have the celebrates that the physician says uh, I need unless I'm willing to pay $250 for it. One of the things that happens with PBMs, they negotiate rebates with the pharmaceutical companies, and the companies that give them the bigger rebates are the ones that they typically that they will drive you to purchase their products. I hear that echo. Is the NSA listening? <laughs> Just go to Google Maps. 
boom, and just pull up our right end. And I want you to look at where that proximity is to so many of the other countries of the world. That's a pretty small scale map. Uh, Israel sits right over here uh, on the side of, of Syria. I want you to think about the countries on this map. Our definition of freedom is only understood in that part, part of the world by the people in Israel. The rest of the people have never experienced it the way we have. If Iran has a nuclear weapon, I can assure you Saudi Arabia is going to have a nuclear weapon. The issue that it is that it potentially sets off a nuclear arms race in an extremely volatile part of the world. Iran has said we won't pursue intercontinental West Westerners. And some of our people are talking about that as if it's a big deal. They don't need them. Where they sit within the region, they've got the missile systems to hit the capitals of dozens of countries that are our friends. They don't need an intercontinental ballistic missile. They've already got a missile with a 5,000 mile range. What their missile system is lacking is a guidance system. And I'd be willing to bet you that when that Iranian general went to Russia, that they were negotiating what Russia was going to sell them a guidance system for their missiles, what it was going to cost them. And once they had it, once they have it, we'll never, we'll never get out of get that guy just out of their hands. I'm opposed to the deal, the agreement, whatever you want to call it. The sanctions against Iran have been working. And when they're working, there is no reason to let them. The other thing I would ask you to keep in mind is that it is the current United States policy is to sanction companies and countries that engage in or fund terrorism. <clears throat> Iran has been funding Hezbollah and Hamas, and they have no plans to stop. Well, funding Hezbollah and Hamas means that it's the U.S. policy to sanction them. And so the deal actually gives them an exception to what the current United States policy is. It makes no sense. And, and, and the way we've handled that part of the world and the way we have uh, the way we have done things, I quite honestly in many cases think we've made it worse. I think that a better policy for the U.S. with regard to that part of the world is to make our friends in that part of the world as strong as they can be economically and financially through trade ties militarily through the sale of um, foreign military sales to those countries. We're still going to help them with intel and the other things that, that we're never going to sell them the systems to provide the intel for. But then they've got to let their, carry, their people carry out the missions in that part of the world. I'll tell you who agrees with that. King Abdullah from Jordan. He met with the members of the Armed Services Committee shortly after ISIS burned his pilot to death. Um, his comment to us was, and, and remember this, he, he's, he's a direct descendant of Muhammad, he is a, he is a faithful Muslim. His comment to us, members of the Armed Services Committee, is you can't fix this. This has been going on, talking about his faith and, and, and his faith for 700 years, and it's up to them to fix it. And quite honestly, I agree with him. I think, I think the atrocities that are going on in that part of the world are hard. But I think that the more we inject ourselves into it, the longer it's going to take for them to be resolved. So let's make our friends and our allies as strong as they can be. Let's make sure we're doing the things to protect them. Um, and then let's, um, let's let them carry out the missions in that part of the country, part of the world, I should say. Let me, uh, let me stop. Try to answer any easy questions. If they're real hard, we'll pass them on to someone else. <laughs> uh, 